morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Karis. Um, glad you're here to worship with us. Um, hope you're doing well, having a good start to your morning. Um, you know, being that I love movies, you know that I was watching the Academy Awards, <laughs> and that was uh, one of the strangest television moments, I think, in history. Um, it's confusing to me at first, and then reality set in, and it was still confusing, almost unbelievable, which made it all the more captivating. Uh, but then I was talking with Doug Ito yesterday, and he was sharing about how he was watching news on a station that was updating the situation in Ukraine, and that one news anchor person asked the reporter what he thought about the slap incident, and the reporter became incredulous, effectively saying, you know, you're asking me about someone getting slapped when there are men, women, and children that are dying every day, uh, which kind of puts it in perspective, uh, not to mention the fact that, you know, I just heard that there's very tragic um, shooting that occurred in downtown Sacramento. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, what happened last Sunday is really not that significant at all. But then you wouldn't know it based upon the amount of attention and headlines that it received, um, but only here in America. Uh, anyway, uh, before I go further, um, let's, let's open up with a word of prayer. Lord, in this uh, moment, um, our hearts are broken for people who are suffering very deeply right now. Um, we live in a world, Father, that is so lost. And more than anything else, we need your love and your presence uh, with us, with those who are suffering in this world, Lord. Uh, to help with the many ways in which we are so broken, Lord. So we do pray for your presence to be with those who are hurting, Lord, and that you would use uh, us as instruments in some way, Lord, not just to help those that might be hurting from today, but those that might be hurting around us in our lives, Lord. Uh, we pray for your blessings on our time that we spend, Lord, I uh, ask that your presence would be here also with us. And uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, a couple of announcements, um, which are, again, the same as last week. Uh, first off, just a reminder that our service next week is not going to be here. We won't be here. Okay, we'll be at Century Theaters on Bighorn Boulevard. Uh, we will have a short service at 10 o'clock. Uh, if you can come to that, please do. Uh, you'll want to be there maybe 10, 15 minutes before 10 o'clock so that when they open up the doors, we can get in as quickly as possible and get our seats. Uh, last week, I told you if you come early, you're probably going to get better seats. <laughs> um, we do know at this time that we are at about, what, 70 to 80 percent capacity. And again, not that that should be any deciding factor or motivation for you coming early. Uh, I just thought that I would throw that update out there for you. Uh, there are still seats that are available. So feel free, if you haven't done so yet, to sign up during the week. Uh, there is no cost to you for the tickets. We just need you to let us know how many are coming in your party by, respend, by responding to uh, the link that Becky had sent out. Okay, so that'll be next week. On Easter Sunday, we're going to be having our first potluck together in a long time. And uh, I've been looking forward to that. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet that will be at the back refreshment table where you can sign up to provide a dish if you can, if you're able to. If you're not, we hope that you'll still come on out and enjoy a meal with us. Uh, we're going to set up tables uh, so it will actually feel more like we're sharing a meal rather than standing around, like I said, holding our food and trying to hold a conversation without dropping anything. Uh, so that will be in a couple of weeks on Easter Sunday. Okay, so that's all for the announcements. Uh, this time I'm, I'm going to move into my message. Um, as I've been doing for most of this year, I'm using the church lectionary readings as the basis for my messages 
primarily using the gospel readings for each week. What's interesting is that for this fifth Sunday of Lent, the gospel reading doesn't come from Luke, which is the gospel that this year's readings have normally stayed with, but it instead has a reading that comes from the Gospel of John. Since the church lectionary goes on a three-year cycle, and the Gospel of Matthew is focused on in year A, the Gospel of Mark is focused on in year B, and the Gospel of Luke in year C, which is the year that we're in this year, and therefore John doesn't have a year of its own, the lectionary disperses readings from the Gospel of John throughout all three of the years, and today is one of the weeks where the Gospel reading comes, not from Luke, but from John. As you can see, it comes from John chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. Uh, I think this particular verse in John is appropriate for this fifth Sunday of Lent for reasons that uh, will become apparent as we go through it together. The context of this passage is that Jesus has been making his way down to Jerusalem from the region of Galilee and is now on the outskirts of the city. Uh, Bethany, as you can see on this map, is just about two miles outside of Jerusalem. It's not the Bethany that's uh, on the east side of the Jordan River that's called Bethany east of the Jordan in the green area in the region of Perea. It's the Bethany just southeast of Jerusalem in the region of Judea. Uh, Bethany is a place Jesus visited more than once throughout the Gospels, primarily because it's the home of his dear friends Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. And it's their home which is the context for the 12th chapter of John's Gospel. So starting with verse 1, here's what it reads. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. So the reason that I think that the church has chosen this passage of scripture from John's gospel is because John is very specific in this passage that Jesus was at Bethany just six days before he entered Jerusalem, which is traditionally recognized as Palm Sunday, which is next Sunday. So in terms of timing, this event at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus fits the calendar leading up to Easter. Uh, now, as I mentioned not too long ago, uh, John's gospel is structured around seven miracles that he calls signs of Jesus. Uh, it began with the turning of water into wine at a wedding celebration that Jesus attended in the village of Cana, and it ends in this town of Bethany with the raising of Lazarus from the dead, which occurred just one chapter earlier in chapter 11. Martha and Mary at that time had reached out to Jesus as he was traveling from town to town, requesting that he come and visit their ailing brother, hoping that like so many other healings that they had heard through the grapevine that Jesus was performing, that he would come and do the same for Lazarus, who was a dear friend of his. Jesus, for whatever reason, didn't immediately respond to the request, but eventually did make his way to Bethany, only to find out that it was too late. Lazarus had died a number of days ago. Martha and Mary were distraught, and Jesus himself was moved to weeping over the loss of Lazarus, and also because of his empathy for Martha and Mary, who were completely devastated by his death. 
But Jesus insisted that he see Lazarus and asked that they remove the stone of his grave, even though Martha objected because the body would already be decaying and the smell would be terrible. But Jesus persisted, so the stone was rolled away. And then Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And then as John put it, the dead man came out. So the stench of that day was replaced, or the stench of death on that day was replaced by the fragrance of life. Now, in chapter 12, Jesus is back in Bethany. We don't know for sure how much time has elapsed from his previous visit, but most scholars believe that not that much time has actually passed. And this time, a different fragrance is going to fill the room of their home. As the text indicates, the annual festival of Passover was only a week away, and Jesus and his disciples were among the thousands of Jews who were making the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. On their way, he stops again at the home of Lazarus, Martha, and Mary for a meal that was prepared in his honor. Uh, many were gathered around the table with Jesus, including Lazarus. And in the middle of the dinner, Mary, overwhelmed with gratitude, likely because Jesus had raised her brother back to life, but I think for other reasons as well, responds with this extravagant act of adoration and gratitude. John writes that Mary took a pint of pure nard, poured it out onto Jesus' feet, and began to wipe his feet with her hair. This was an incredibly costly gift for Mary to bestow on Jesus. This particular perfume, nard, was likely imported from India and was extremely expensive. In fact, nard was often kept as an investment during those days because it was portable and required no maintenance and was very marketable. Not only that, but the amount of perfume Mary poured onto Jesus' feet, a full pint, was worth the equivalent of about a year's worth of a day laborer's wages. So, for instance, if you took a year's worth of the current minimum wage of $15 an hour here in our state, at 40 hours a week over 52 weeks, that comes out to be $31,200, which might be a little bit high since our minimum wage tends to be higher here in our country, but it's a decent rough estimate of the value of the nard that Mary had poured out onto Jesus' feet. In addition, in that setting, it would have been considered improper for a woman to have her hair unbound. But Mary not only let her hair down, but she then uses her hair to wipe Jesus' feet, which I'm sure was shocking to many of the people that were there. John adds that the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. And it's likely that John and everyone else who was there that night never forgot about that overwhelming fragrance. It's a smell that would have lingered on in that household for quite a number of days and even longer in the memories of those who had witnessed it. Now, as you may know, of all of our senses, our sense of smell is the most powerful when it comes to triggering memories. Of the five senses that we have, our sense of smell is the one that is quickly linked, they say, to our emotional recollections. Researchers have discovered that our sense of smell is highly emotive and that it's capable of arousing intense feeling. The perfume industry is built around this connection with perfumers developing fragrances that seek to convey a vast array of emotions and feelings from desire to relaxation to power. If you just stop and think back for a moment upon the smells that you have experienced throughout your life, there are probably some that bring back very specific memories and feelings that are associated with those memories. Uh, one that came to my mind as I was kind of thinking through this message and thinking through my life um, is the smell of fermented Japanese pickle that my mom wanted to make I don't know, 
seemed like every year at one time. Um, she would put them into these containers and they would just sit in our garage for months. She'd keep them in these very, really large jars, I think, right? Where they these large jars and she'd rubber band the top so that they would be tightly sealed while they fermented. And then when it came time to open the jars, she would warn the entire family that she was going to open up and take out the pickles and release the kraken because we all knew what this meant, right? Because it didn't matter that she did it outside in the garage with the door closed. The smell of those fermented pickles would permeate the entire house. Uh, it was, wasn't a pleasant smell. But if I smell it now, it reminds me of my mom. Uh, the Christian author C.S. Lewis wrote a poem called On Being Human. And one of the sentences in that poem refers to this idea that a fragrance, a smell, can cause what he says is a tremor in the rippled pool of memory. Uh, scientists have studied and concluded that our brains are capable of distinguishing quite a number of different smells. So anyone out there just want to take a wild guess? How many different smells do you think the average person can distinguish? Just take a guess. Throw it out there. How many do you think? Wild guess. One million. One million. And do I hear anything else? Well, if you Google it, here are the first few articles that will pop up. Apparently, researchers have somehow determined that we have the capability to distinguish as many, maybe even more, than one trillion different smells. And I read that, my first thought is, that can't be true. <laughs> I can't even count to a trillion. That just sounds like way too many. But apparently, our noses are that sensitive. What Mary did that evening during the meal created this powerful smell that permeated that entire house. But Judas complains that the nard could have been sold and the money then given to the poor. Of course, John includes some details about Judas that he probably learned after the fact when he was writing his gospel some 50 to 60 years later. I doubt that he knew this information about Judas at the time that this event occurred. But it doesn't take away from the fact that Judas had other ulterior motivations. Having said that, on the face value of what Judas said, part of me kind of agrees with it. I mean, couldn't the nard have been sold for, what, 30 some odd thousand dollars in our day's terms and used to help People who were struggling. I mean, there's a lot of good that could have been done for unfortunate people with that kind of money. So a part of me does think that. But then at the same time, I also realize that you have this man Jesus with you who recently fed 10,000 men, or 10,000 men and women and children, with but a Long John Silver's kids meal. So... Jesus is certainly capable of providing more to the cause of the poor than even this expensive you know, pint of nard if he chose to. You see, there's something happening here that transcends the calculating, pragmatical side of our human nature. Mary is pouring out more than just a pint of nard. She is pouring out her heart in an offer of love and gratitude, and Jesus finds something incredibly valuable to that gesture. To understand where I think Jesus is coming from, we need to paint a better picture of what's going on here. At this point in the gospel story, according to John, Jesus is close to Jerusalem. But not only that, the tension in the air is higher than it has ever been in his ministry. After he raised Lazarus from the dead in chapter 11, it says that many people began to believe in Jesus because of that miracle. But the Pharisees 
and the highest ranking religious leaders in Jerusalem, not that far away, had had enough. Although they certainly didn't believe in his message or in him, they recognized that he was creating such a stir that it was only a matter of time before Rome would step in and squash this movement that he was creating and an armed response would potentially annihilate the entire city. And so they made formal plans in chapter 11 to capture him and have him arrested and ultimately to take his life. The high priest Caiaphas issued the order and so it says in chapter 11 that at that point in time, Jesus could not move freely about. And he was essentially hiding out in the wilderness with his disciples before making his way back to Jerusalem. He makes this stop in Bethany, not more than two miles from the city of Jerusalem. Now, no one really knows why Lazarus, Martha, and Mary had become his closest friends. But we do know that their bond to one another and their love for one another was deep. And I think it's natural in life that when we know that we are in danger, when we're experiencing anguish and suffering through difficult moments in our lives, we long to just have someone simply be with us, to accept us for who we are, to comfort us just by being there. Someone who will not desire something from us or press an agenda upon us like Judas did, but who will just share in our apprehension, even without words. Such was the friendship between Jesus and these three siblings. We already know that they loved having him over for a visit. Martha was always anxious to feed him and Mary anxious to listen to him. In one previous meeting, when the two sisters argued, his visit to them was for their sake. And then when their brother Lazarus died, his coming to them was for all of their sakes. But in this moment, at this time, I believe Jesus is there for himself. He needs human companionship and comfort, and they give it to him. They call over their friends to have a dinner. Martha, as is her habit of doing, is feeding the people that she loves. Mary, who's gifted in other ways and who seems to be more driven by her heart, does something else. You see, I think Mary senses something ominous at this time. I think her heart is more attuned to Jesus than anyone else there, including his closest disciples. Food is not enough for her. Only the most precious gift will express her love adequately in that moment and her desire just to be there for, her, for him. It's a lovely moment. Jesus describes it as a beautiful thing in Matthew's and Mark's rendering of this encounter. The whole house fills with an exquisite aroma of thanksgiving. A beautiful moment that gets spoiled by the pettiness of one who has stopped loving his teacher and whose heart had actually turned against him at this point in time. Judas claims that beauty and gratitude of this nature is a waste and a useless extravagance of resources. And as I mentioned at first thought, part of me kind of agrees. But then I thought, okay, well, if 300 denarii, which is what a year's worth of wages is, if that's too much, what about 250? What about 200? What about 100? At what point does the cost become acceptable and reasonable? We don't know what that number might have been for Judas. We'll never know. And that's not actually the point we should take from this reading. The more relevant question is about us. What is your number? What's my number? What is our limit? At what point do we say simply costs too much to love? And is love and devotion expressed in this kind of extraordinary way ever really a waste? 
with the war going on in Ukraine, I was reading this story about a somewhat similar situation back in 1941 when Russia was the one being invaded by Germany and how brutal the circumstances were for the city of Leningrad. Let me read for you an excerpt that I read about a Russian composer named Dmitry Shostakovich. In June of 1941, Dmitry Shostakovich was a successful composer and the head of the Leningrad Conservatory's piano department. He and millions of others were suddenly uprooted by the surprise bombardment of Leningrad by German forces, breaking the non-aggression pact Hitler had signed with Russia and beginning a siege that would last almost two and a half years. Although Shostakovich was evacuated, his heart remained with his besieged city, and he began writing what would become the defining work of his career. His massive seventh symphony began to take shape. Music that told the story of war and sacrifice and heroism inspired by and dedicated to Leningrad. The siege wore on through the terrible winter of 1941. Once the starving residents had eaten all the dogs, cats, and rats in the city, they moved on to leather handbags and suitcases. By January 1942, they were subsisting on wallpaper paste and sawdust. Thousands of frozen, starved bodies littered the streets every day, and the survivors barely clinging to life soon no longer had the physical strength to clear the corpses away. The death toll climbed to 1.2 million. In February, Shostakovich finished the symphony and it premiered to worldwide acclaim in Moscow, London, and New York. But Shostakovich knew that the true premiere had not happened yet. The Leningrad, symf Leningrad symphony, to truly come to life, had to be played in Leningrad. The sheet music was smuggled into the city across German lines. Leningrad's premier orchestra, the Philharmonic, had been evacuated before the siege closed in, and the leftover ra Radiocom Orchestra was all that remained. Of their ranks, 70 had frozen or starved to death in the siege, and only 20 were left alive. And yet, rehearsals began. The musicians were utterly physically debilitated. They barely had the strength to lift their instruments and rehearsals at the rehearsals, which were limited to 15-minute intervals and were frequently punctuated by orchestra members fainting from hunger or cold. In fact, they never had the physical strength to play the entire symphony through at once until the actual performance. In one incredible episode, a percussionist was reported dead and the conductor, who needed him desperately for the symphony, went to the morgue to check. He saw movement in one stack of corpses, and it was his percussionist, still alive, but too weak to protest being carted off with the dead. The conductor rescued him, and he went on to play in the performance. On August 9, 1942, the cobbled together starving orchestra in Leningrad performed the entire Symphony No. 7 for their audience of emaciated but defiant fellow citizens in an epic triumph of the human spirit. This was the exact date Hitler had boasted he would have a victory dinner in the Hotel Astoria to celebrate conquering Leningrad. This symphony played by the starving orchestra. In some sense, you can probably view that as a useless, extravagant gesture. It didn't shorten the siege. It didn't provide any food or resources to help people to survive those terrible conditions. In fact, three musicians in the orchestra died during the rehearsal period their lives undoubtedly cut short by having to exert themselves physically just to play their instruments. But this incredible gesture on the part of the symphony members helped a city beaten down almost to death hold out just long enough to be liberated. And we have to wonder, if Mary's gesture 
in our gospel reading that we read today in some way, maybe, functioned in the same way for Jesus. Not too long from this moment in time, Jesus would be arrested, whipped and beaten, tried and executed. It wouldn't take long for all of that to happen. And I wonder for how long during this process did the smell of that perfume continue to stay with him? And every time he smelled it, he remembered Mary's great act of love and devotion. And maybe in some way this helped to carry his spirit during this time. If so, then it was actually a relatively small price to pay. In our lives, it's going to be the acts of love from other people that are going to give us the courage and the strength to carry on in the face of adversity. In the times when we're pushed beyond what we think we can endure, whether it's sitting by the bedside of a loved one as he or she slowly succumbs to cancer, or bearing the pain of a spouse or a parent who no longer recognizes us through the fog of dementia, or the moment that we hear that one of our children has been in a terrible accident, or times when we ourselves are dealing with the pain of chronic illness or maybe a debilitating injury. What helps us to endure these times are these gestures of love that we receive from others, the unfiltered gestures of love, support, and tenderness that provides us with enough hope to weather the storm. This story is not about money or perfume. It's about love. And upon whose feet are we willing to pour out the fragrance of our lives and our love? Because if we're honest, we usually have our limits, our reasons, our fears that keep us from loving, convincing us that it's just not practical or reasonable. Not this person, not right now, not here. This story takes us to the boundaries of what is practical, what is reasonable, what makes sense, and then asks us to step across it because that is the way of love. That's the way of Christ. As one author put it, yes, the perfume will fade, but life is eternal and love is immortal. Let's pray together. Lord, I know in my life there are times, especially being an accountant, when I can be very calculated, Lord. When I think about whether something is reasonable for me to do, so often, Lord, we fail to love people when we reach that kind of place in our hearts, Lord. Love is not something really that can be calculated, Lord. And so I pray that our hearts through this story would be opened up, Lord, to realize that there is really no such thing when it comes to extravagance when we talk about love. Love should be extravagant. And so I pray that, Lord, as we approach Lent, or as we approach Easter, that you would help our hearts, Lord, to understand the extravagance, Lord, in a sense of the love that you displayed on the cross. Um, help us to understand, Lord, that we are called to do the same kind of thing in our lives to those who are hurting, and there are people hurting right now, Lord. So thank you for our time, and uh, we pray that you bless our time of uh, communion and prayer now, and we pray this in your name. Amen.